The part I look forward to the most is hearing your questions, comments, agreements, disagreements. Okay, so I'll throw it back to you now. Karsten, you're up. Okay, thank you, Doug. This was really comprehensive in a very short time. I'm very impressed to see how you were able to condense all this. You basically condensed your whole book mm -hmm. <laughs> into 50 minutes, <laughs> getting all the salient parts. Um, I would ask three kinds of questions and just pick at any one or... Mm -hmm. Uh, what you think might be the most important thing to say. Um, the first is uh, something I've been thinking of. What would be the relation of Gandhi's understanding to Buddhism? Uh, I think of that in two ways. One in, one, in the, one in terms of the whole idea of anatta, no, no self, no soul. Uh, Gandhi was Hindu, so there would be a difference there. And the second would be it seems to me that Buddhism would pr uh, prioritize loving kindness and compassion over the idea of justice. Whereas I sense in Gandhi, justice is at least an equal value or perhaps a greater value. That's the first question. Okay. Second question is, um, goes along with your question of, is there no, uh, are there no uh, nonviolent options? Um, and that raises the question for me of the Ukrainian resistance, mm -hmm. how, how to move toward that. And I mean that not just in the way that Ukraine was invaded and maybe they need, there's no a moment of dialogue, but it is possible that there could be dialogue, but the dialogue might be, for example, to give up Donbass and, and just let those people suffer. I mm -hmm. mean, how would Gandhi, or a Gandhian approach handle that. And the third, just open-ended, what's going on in the Mideast? There are two peoples there, each who have traumas of their own. Um, and there seems to be no settlement in sight. What kinds of insights do you think Gandhi might have for that kind of problem? Now, mm -hmm. that's much bigger than you can answer in a few minutes. But I yeah. thought of those three right. things. Okay. Well, uh... Thank you, Karsten, for those simple questions that I can so easily answer. Um, the, uh, and of course, uh, I'm interested in all three and uh, areas and struggle with them. So let me give you the, um, the first one, which is uh, difficult, but all easier for me. The, uh, so I would say in terms of Gandhi's understanding of Buddhism and then the uh, other aspects you mentioned, uh, yes, uh, the uh, Gandhi uh, has great admiration for Buddhism because it came out of Indian soil. And uh, he, you know, basically he emphasizes uh, what uh Buddhism shares with Hinduism. In fact, Gandhi claims, although this is a big claim, he claims all religions at their heart actually embrace nonviolence and peace. And uh, But then what happens when they become institutionalized and so forth? So Gandhi is very sympathetic to Buddhism, to the teachings of many of the teachings of Buddha, the, I would say uh, the disagreements he has, um, and just a few is, and it's not only Buddhism, uh, he thinks that um, uh, Buddhism, uh, on the one hand, uh, it tended to be too passive in terms of uh, the Sangha, how it was organized, the uh, in the sense that 
it tended, there was a strong tendency, and again, you get the opposites, of course, but a strong tendency in the teachings and essential teaching scriptures of Buddhism and the uh, to say, well, if this world is a world of samsara, it's the world of suffering, if you're really enlightened, if you're really a spiritual, like some of the spiritual monks, you'll let go of this world, you know, and you'll seek nirvana, and you, uh, so it's a sign of illusion or ignorance that people who, in a Gandhi way, are engaged and Gandhi taking this world so seriously and the focus and transforming this world. The, um, and uh, the other thing, of course, that bothers Gandhi and that bothered me in my own life, I had a whole sabbatical in Sri Lanka and uh, right after the civil war had started there and and the and you have it now in Myanmar and Burma and all these different places that are going on. How uh, when you historically contextualize Buddhism, it often takes forms that are very violent. And then the question is that. And they use the teachings, and all religions do this, in ways uh, that contradict what I see the spiritual, moral, powerful teachings in Buddhism. So the, and in terms of loving, you're right about uh, uh, loving kindness, the um, uh, over justice. And I've had many experiences with some Tibetan and other top uh, Buddhist spiritual leaders, and they, they just can't quite get a handle on justice. They'll say, we don't know what you mean by justice. That's not a fundamental value in our Buddhism. Now, not all of them that are like that. You know, there are many Buddhists, in fact, uh, some who share a lot with Gandhi, one Arya Ratna who just passed away recently, and it was a kind of Buddhist uh, Gandhian activism. So those are big challenges. Uh, and why I always say in all of these, including yours, it's always important not just to have the kind of abstract or essential teachings, but to always situate them, contextualize them, because sometimes they come out the exact opposite of what you would expect initially. So, uh, but I, uh, I think Buddhism still, uh, to me, has so much to offer the world, and especially which Gandhi shares, the whole focus on the ego and how we construct that false self and we become ego desires, ego attached, ego, and how that leads to all disastrous consequences for us and for others. So those, and then we'll, let's see if we get some others. And then uh, if not, of course, I'm very concerned with Ukraine and I'm very concerned what's happening every single day in Gaza in uh, the West Bank, uh, in Israel, you now in Lebanon, and, and throughout the Middle East. Okay, I see a hand up there. Judith? Well, uh, yeah. Judith. Yeah. There's a hand. Hi. Yeah. Thank Hi. you, Gabriel. I so enjoyed your, your talk. Um, this has been fascinating. I, you know, was thinking about how we perpetuate our complicit and almost hypocrites in, in calling ourselves, you know, peaceful people. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly am among in that category and how um, you just made clear again, the point that, you know, being ego, egocentric, that we, we overt, what did you give the, the percentage? 90% um, it's not overt violence, but that we're complicit in this multi, in a dimensional and structural violence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I find this so fascinating because I really truly am invested in being peace and living a moral and ethical life. And that is my primary focus in how I'm being in the world, you know, be the change that you want to be in. Yeah. And that um, the idea that to be the meta, the idea of meta or loving kindness, right. that is, you cannot be a loving and kind person and be in conflict. 
love with there is no love without justice and there is no justice without love because there is equanimity there is right. simply equanimity you can't do unto others something you wouldn't do unto yourself if you love them you certainly wouldn't be attacking them or in conflict so right. you know but i just i loved your closing and i'll close too with this how um you know that we we idealize we idealize jesus christ and what would christ jesus christ say if he came back the same thing god he would say if he came back you know what are you doing with me you know how are you using me or how are you following me how are you being like me in the world and right. i just love that um the way you called him a gad gadfly <laughs> and how yeah. he perplexes perplexed even his closest friends because they didn't know what to do with him right Remind you have a question, Judith? Oh, um, there was one. <laughs> Just wondering. I'm getting lost. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can make a question out of Judith's comments if need be, because there were good questions. You were yeah. right there. Yeah, yeah you know? I am questioning myself, but I don't yeah. know that you can answer them. I yeah. think it's all general, universal questions, how, how yeah. we can bring how we can bring the awareness of his teachings in right. daily life. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me just say, Judith, thank you. And just in terms of two of the key things you mentioned and where, how I, you know, there are many ways of interpreting Gandhi and uh, relating him to complementary non-Gandhian positions. Uh, but uh, the two things I just quickly share, one is with Metta and so forth. Uh, one problem I find, and again, uh, is that in, in the hundred volumes of Gandhi's collective works, you can find almost everything as people <laughs> do. But uh, a common position that I see with love, Metta and so forth is People, which is to me a non-Gandhian approach, even people who think they're following Gandhi or Jesus or others, uh, they'll say, well, you know, I have to first find my, I have to be a loving person. I have to first learn how to love myself before I can love others. You know, and they have different formulations. And you know what? It's for Gandhi, it's an escapism. They never get around to loving others. And that's a lot of people who, what their meditation is. They're so focused on their own individual development uh, that, so what, uh, for me, the valuable Gandhian thing, okay, constantly work on being a more loving person. But also part of being a more loving person is relating to others who are suffering. <laughs> That's how, you know, uh, the other, the other who's suffering is part of who you are, right? How you become and develop as a human being. And the uh, complicity thing also to me is very tricky because I think what Gandhi says in terms of uh, Gandhi, Gandhi, the great uh, proponent, exemplary of nonviolence, Gandhi struggles. Gandhi finds over and over again he was very violent. He even refers to some of, you know, his autobiography as my experiments with truth. And he finds that often his life as experiments with truth are failed experience, experiments. He even wow. refers to some of them as Himalayan blunders. <laughs> and so it's, in a way, we all are complicit. But how do we deal with that? For example, uh, for example, I was a professor at the University of Maine. I never had any illusion how I was complicit with all kinds of things that I personally violated my ideals including a lot of the grading and a lot of the hierarchical, corporatized, commodified nature of the university. The, oh. the alternative, of course, was to resign, right? And so 
uh, and that wasn't very helpful. Uh, I know a lot of people who say they won't pay taxes because it goes for war. Because I share all of that. But that's fine if you have no income. Right? I found when I tried not to pay taxes before I came here at the university, guess what? The government and my university and the bank, they just took the money out of my salary. They didn't ask my permission. Now, I could have said, okay, I'm going to spend years and years challenging that, make that a central focus in my life. Or I could have said, well, uh, uh, I'm going to try to do peace and justice activism to try to change that as much as possible. Okay, so I think in a way, as Camus says, in one way, we're all on, we're all kind of innocent murderers. <laughs> he puts it dramatically, you know, to live in this world, we all do harm, not just towards human life, to inhuman life, to other life, right? And uh, yeah. we, so we all know that, but it's like, how can we live in a way that uh, we minimize how we're complicit and we create a world where there's less complicity with violence and exploitation and so forth. Okay, who would? Do we have uh, another comment or question or disagreement, something out there? I have a question. This is Stan. Yeah. Sure. Um, how does Gandhi propose cultivating ahimsa within oneself? In other words, we've been talking today about practicing ahimsa and um, uh, and uh, developing loving kindness. And I mean, practicing loving kindness. But but you know, if you start out by feeling like, well, I I'm not a loving kind person. Right. Uh, how do you? I mean, I think I think Gandhi wrestles with this quite a bit, but um within himself but question is is there a is there a path does he does he chart a path for doing this of you know actual steps to take to to cultivate the 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 that inner soul force right uh, and so on i mean it's great to say yeah don't don't act without soul force behind you but if you don't have it, <laughs> start with. Anyway. After Stan, after yeah. Stan, we have Todd. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's um uh, Todd, why don't you throw out what uh what you'd like to share and then we can I can just comment briefly on Stan's uh so Todd, why don't you share? Uh, can you hear me? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I found this uh, immensely stimulating, and uh, I have so many thoughts. Um, uh, I don't have a question. I have lots of uh, lots of thoughts. Uh, so, but I, I'm also uh, I think uh, Karsten's question. You know what? What would uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, what would his approach be towards Ukraine or the Middle East, uh, I think is a, a great question. I'd, I'd love to hear you, um, uh, what, what, what you imagine. Um, but just to say in, in a few sentences, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish and I, I, I see, I, I appreciate the sort of unified, uh, uh, what, what you described as Mahatma Gandhi's uh, vision that that of interconnectedness and and i i see that um i i i see that in in judaism i'm not proselytizing here just it, it's fascinating to see the 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 how how different approaches touch each other uh or o overlap and um uh similarly uh well just strain of uh, stream of consciousness I, I like the idea that Mahatma Gandhi would would uh, would abhor his um, the reverence uh, you know or idolization uh, mm -hmm. that that um, and that brings to mind reconstructing Judaism, which is uh, that uh, rather than 
following uh, a, a way uh, uh, fundamentally that to evolve to the current situation to apply things. Um, so let me stop there because I could keep going on. Yeah. The uh, okay. So yeah. No, that's good. So let me just say uh, because. You know, Gandhi, uh, in terms of Ahimsa, like Stan said, uh, uh, Gandhi has hundreds of messages on that, but it's basically uh, the way you live your life, okay? And, and that's a struggle. And Gandhi gives all kinds of practical things that he did. And he says, other people may have other ways. Uh, for example, uh, Gandhi had prayer, what he called prayer session every single day. And the prayer sessions, the main important thing in terms of Ahimsa is there's a chapter, a section of a chapter in the Bhagavad Gita, the scripture of the Bhagavad Gita, that talks about the ideal, the exemplary human being, the most perfected human being. Gandhi chanted that and read that every single day, every day, because that was like a model for him. How do I become more like that? Gandhi, at many of these sessions every day, he had music. There was a certain ritualized music that Gandhi felt was very spiritual. It was non-cognitive, wasn't an intellectual thing, but it touched you deeply in your free in your subconscious, your emotions, your imagination, your pre-reflective. And it was very transformative in allowing you to develop in the direction of Ahimsa. Uh, but Gandhi, I just want to say, and uh, there, you could go on and on. Uh, Gandhi, though, is no one, and it, this relates to a little bit of Todd's point, no one was more self-critical than Gandhi. Gandhi has thousands of pages, almost too much. He blames himself for all kinds of things that uh, it's because he's impure. He said, if he was more perfected, people would not act that way <laughs> in the world. And uh, he's extremely uh, self-critical. And at the end of his life, Gandhi felt in some of these big things, and like you're raising, Gandhi felt that he was very depressed at the end of his life. And he said, you know, here I, for 50, 60 years, I focused on communal harmony, harmony between Muslims uh, and Hindus and others, or you could say between Jews and non-Jews, between Jews and Palestinians. Well, this time, he said, for 60 years, I focused on that and I'm a failure. Late in my life, they're killing each other after partition. A million people are dead. Hundreds of thousands are being raped. No one's listening. And he said the same about caste, untouchability. He said, here, this has been such a focus. He's satyagraha is around caste. He's, he's fasted to the death to try to present, prevent caste violence. And he saw how... Caste still existed in this hierarchical oppressive gender. He talks so much about with women. And Gandhi's record is very mixed. But finally, Gandhi is has a very liberated view about male and female and as co-partners, and there should be no male superiority, and on and on. And he looks, and there's all this patriarchal sexism in India, in his in Hinduism. So, um, so it is a struggle, and uh, in this regard, and there are no simple answers. But I just want to say, Gandhi would say, the fact that you may have a lot of hatred and anger, I do too all the time. I mean, um, when I look right now at what the Trump, what Trump does or says, I can't. I'm, I'm not kind and loving towards what Trump is saying. And um, and to me, it's white supremacist, neo-Nazi, it's fascistic, it's autocratic, dictatorial, it's with approval of the uh, 
politicized Supreme Court from whom I expect nothing but an erosion of all the things that we believe in. And so I don't feel loving and kind, but the point is, how do you not go under? If you're just, that's all you're thinking about every day. And you have to take it in moderation. If you spend your whole day on the social media and watching some of the so-called pundits, it leaves you in really a hopeless and helpless feeling. So part of the Ahimsa thing and the stuff Todd was thinking is how we, we don't escape, we acknowledge the horror of what's happening, but how we connect with people who have do amazing things every day in their life. I mean, there are so many, you know, incredibly powerful things in terms of love and kindness and being concerned about the suffering of others. There are people all around us and all over the world who do such amazing things and often act with such courage, right? So um, I would say, and in terms of uh, what's happening in the Middle East and Judaism, and this is what Gandhi, Gandhi says, religion is not inherently positive or negative. All religions are full of horrific things. Gandhi says at the end, if Hinduism cannot abolish caste, and very soon, Hinduism should be abolished. And he's a Hindu. He says it has no light, uh, right to continue if it maintains uh, caste hierarchical oppression. So I would say in the same way with Judaism, when I look back, I'm like, there's some things going back to ancient Israel, that in the history, some things in the Bible and the early teachings, they're really pretty horrible. And there are other things that are very inspiring. So I think, you know, it's how to creatively be selective in reimagining, reactivating the parts that are positive. And um, that's why it's not enough, but we try to relate to a lot of the Israeli and Palestinian groups, and also groups like I've supported for decades, uh, the Holy Land Trust, which is mainly out of nonviolent, out of Bethlehem, Just Vision, which again is mainly not Jewish, uh, but there are people who have been involved in Jerusalem and other places, acting courageously for decades. Mm -hmm. and, and then the combatants and other group families, you know, all these groups, to try to relate to those groups, but you have to do more than that, right? And uh, and so, anyway, those are a few things. Uh, well, here's another, I don't see any other hands, so... Okay. I'll, uh, I'm sorry, Karsten. Karsten has a hand as oh, well. Oh, Karsten, go yeah. ahead. All right, I didn't see her. Okay. Good. I I just wanted to say one thing about your last comment and then ask you a question. Okay. To, to it. Uh, there's some really interesting new groups. There's one called Standing Together. Yes. Jews and Palestinians that are really hopeful. They're just saying, you know, our elders have just created such shit. We've got to think. Right. Oh, right paradigm and come to another kind of solution, which is strikes me as very Gandhian in that. Right. right. The question I would ask, since you mentioned religion and what if Hinduism can't get away from caste, is what do you make of the conflict between Gandhi and Ambedkar? To some extent, uh, Gandhi was very critical of Ambedkar when mm -hmm. he left Hinduism. He says, you don't just you know, you don't just change religions like you change clothes. And right. I was very critical of Gandhi. He said, you're not sufficiently anti-caste. Right. So what, what do you make of that? Okay, so that's a big thing. And what often would happen in India is if I was giving a talk that either was on Gandhi or sympathetic in many ways to Gandhi, uh, and I had this happen repeatedly over the decades, so many times in India. Someone would get up and make a speech, and they'd say, I am a follower of Dr. Ambedkar. 
who of course was the author, among other things, of a work called The Annihilation of Caste. And, and we hate Gandhi. Gandhi is an enemy of the uh, untouchables, the outcasts, the disadvantaged, the Dalits, and so forth, would make a long speech. And, and then often some of the young ones who had never read Gandhi, and they just, but they, some would come to see me and they were very troubled because they wanted to convince me that uh, I should attack Gandhi. And often I would listen, I'd be empathetic because contextualize, there's some who are just violent and they just, uh, and privileged and powerful and are just demagogues and so forth. But there were others who I'd listen and you'd say, I'd say, well, you know, I agree with a lot of what you say. And in some ways, Dr. Ambedkar was much better on caste that, than Gandhi was, including at the end, as you said, he became a Buddhist uh, because he felt Hinduism was would never overcome caste. But then having said that, and again, it's my position, people disagree, I would say, well, in some ways, Gandhi was more anti-caste than Ambedkar. Mm -hmm. and, and I really think that you can make that argument because Ambedkar was kind of very privileged. He was westernized. He got his degree from Columbia, he had his law degree. He um, was a main architect of the Indian constitution. But he accepted a lot of the kind of modern, Western-centric, you know, views. And in some ways, Gandhi offers a very radical critique of that. And, uh, and Gandhi late in his life, because you can pick out parts of Gandhi's writings that uh, just have to be left behind. But Gandhi late in his life, he doesn't even want to talk about caste. Gandhi always, with his upbringing, his religious family, his ashrams in South Africa and India, Gandhi was always radically anti-caste, but temperamentally. But at the end, Gandhi is so disgusted with caste India that he doesn't even want to talk about it. You know, he just, let's move on. You know, there's no debate. In other words, you can't justify caste. And Gandhi is always promoting uh, marriages between different castes, different, you know, all these things. So, um, so I think it's a good issue. And, I, you know, we should have a dialogue. I think Ambedkar has insights that Gandhi doesn't have. But I also think Gandhi has a lot of insights that are more revolutionary and involve more of a paradigm shift than Ambedkar does. Um, and, uh, let's see, what was, uh, uh, let's see, was it Stan? Did you have something you were going to raise there? I think, uh, then we said, uh, Karsten had a raised hand, so that was good. The, um, we do have a message from Todd saying, thank you so much, Doug. Okay. Well, I thank him. Todd has always had some very thoughtful uh, feedback and concerns. Um, and he's now uh, chairing the uh, Social Action Committee at the congregation Bethel in Bangor. So, you know, they're struggling with a lot of these issues right now. Great. Okay. I'm not sure we're Stan. Perhaps Stan had to step off for a moment. Yeah. But unless we have any other questions, I think we're at a, a stopping point and we really appreciate you sharing with us, Doug. Yes. Okay. The next time I'll solve the Ukrainian problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's, boy, these, uh, um, you know, it's so hard, let's I'll say, and Karsten certainly knows this, and with him and Olga and all, uh, the, um, there are all these leftist groups, which, as you know, 
And I have agreed over the decades with 90%. In fact, I identify with a lot of them. And then they had they had this position that they have till this day that um, the problem is Western US-led militarism, imperialism. What we have to do is we have to abolish NATO. Totally, 100% abolish NATO. Abolish the European Union. We have to, and... Um, and here are all these fascists, right? And oh, and all we want to do is encircle Russia and have bases and missiles all around Russia. And uh, so they wind up with a position that sounds very pro Putin without changing a word. And they're making a lot of good points. And there's something wrong with the whole thing. It's like they're out of touch with reality. And like, um, and in that view, they have, of course, uh, Zelensky is a fascist. Uh, uh, he's, Zelensky is corrupt. Zelensky, all these issues, I've been concerned about Eastern European fascism <laughs> and the Holocaust, all that stuff, you know, have been so formative in a lot of our thinking and in the corruption of the oligarchs. But it's like, there's something off. I mean, Putin's an oligarch. <laughs> you, know, I'm just, you know, and all this, and uh, he's, you know, and, uh, and the suppression, the repression, the violence, the disappearance of any kind of dissent. And I'm saying, well, we don't want to raise any of that because that would encourage U.S. imperialism. Yeah, there's something wrong with that position. So what it means is when you try to contextualize that, you see all these contradictions. And in many cases, you have to just try to distinguish the short term from the long term. Where we're at right now, what do we need to do to create some space? And then even though it's unsatisfactory, and then we're hoping, uh, even if it's future generations, that uh, we can create a world where we don't, we're not as entrapped in these almost impossible situations. I was going to say they don't understand there can be two imperialist powers. I know. That's yeah. The basic for that. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. I Doug, agree. Yep. Doug, I've got a quick question. Um, okay. I, don't, I don't know how much time we have. I don't know what time this goes to. Jackson, I didn't see you. Good. Yeah. Hello? Why don't you, you'd be a new voice. So why don't you throw out something? Sure. So, I mean, <clears throat> in the, you know, I was just listening to what you were saying about um, Ukraine and Putin and, uh, you know, really calling calling out the uh, American industrial or military industrial complex, um, our proclivity for war uh, and the amount of, of uh, military aid that we're providing to foreign countries. Um, I don't think you're, you're wrong at all um, in saying that there's context to why some of those things are necessary, because if we did not uh, support Ukraine, then Putin would steamroll it and so on and so forth. And I think that's really you can copy and paste that situation into a lot of different scenarios in which, um, you know, there will be people that are violent. There will be people that, you know, want power um, and are willing to use violence to get it. So um, I think the the question of nonviolent resistance is really important. But I'm curious to know, like, uh, what... Um, how 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 effective could nonviolent resistance be on on that term? You know, in the in the sense of like we don't want war, we don't want violence. You know, we want to disengage from war. What do you do when war comes to you, anyways? Um, and you can choose to participate or you can choose to lose. Um, mm -hmm. I, I certainly don't support war uh, or violence, but I just think it's a really hard. Um, question and Ukraine being an example of that, you know, I think that's what so many people struggle with is, you know, their support for uh, violence in any form, but at the same time, the absence of that resistance 
um, certainly would lead to more death, more violence, more rape, and, you know, uh, just destruction of the Ukrainian state in general, and state after that, and state after that, and state after that. Now, this is a Czechoslovakia, you know, 1938 or so, so. Right. Okay. So I think I could be wrong, but I think what you're raising was a central part of my presentation. And so, you know, I did um, spend a lot of time on the uh, earlier on what you do with a Hitler, what you do, you know, um, with uh, in terms of the Holocaust, what do you do? I mean, and I'm saying the um, Gandhi often says some things and some of his advice to Jews, at least some that Martin Buber and others challenged. I agree with Buber. I think Gandhi's response were inadequate. And you don't tell people who are facing the Holocaust or being sent out to extermination camps, oh, they, they should practice Gandhi and Satyagraha and be completely nonviolent so you can transform the heart of the Nazis. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's... To me, that's not just an ignorant, but it's an immoral uh, response. So I, I exactly, uh, I've tried to offer things in saying that uh, Gandhi has a lot of passages where he talks about how violent resistance may be the most nonviolent alternative mm -hmm. in cases like you just described, but never glorify the violence. Yeah. And never glorify it and limit the necessary violence. And then mainly try to change the conditions in this world so you don't keep repeating the same patterns of war and violence and terror and hatred. And um, that's a difficult thing to do. But to me, uh, it's it's essential to yeah. how I live my life and what gives meaning to my life. Okay, so I, I apologize. Um, I do need to run. I've got a meeting at, at 1.30, oh, um, and I joined this conversation a little bit late, so that's why I didn't hear the first part of your presentation. No but um, I appreciate the opportunity, and I uh, hope you guys have a great rest of your day. All right, thank you, and thank, thank you, you for joining. Yep. I see one more question from Karsten, and then we'll go ahead and shut down. Stan no, has no. lost. Stan it's, has lost his video and his audio, so after yeah, Karsten and Doug have, have a couple okay. things to say, we'll shut well, down. I want, to, I want to make a comment uh, about the Ukraine situation. When just thinking it out now, there is a way to apply some of Gandhi to this. Right. Because I, I mean, I would agree and completely support the Ukrainian resistance in this particular context. But there's something dissatisfying about that resistance. Right. Glory to the heroes, constant yeah. refrain. It's yeah, not right. necessity. It's glorious. That's right. That's terrible. And right. crossing the border into Russia, well, there's some logic to that if you hit some kind of military installation. But then they move a little further and they're hit, right. hit millions. So you can say, well, OK, their resistance is legitimate, but you got to minimize the violence. No, that's no right. violence that's not necessary. And right. no notification of violence. And I think you can see it in the Ukraine situation. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I think that's really good. And that's like I tried to show a good Gandhian insight because in terms of the glory to the hero, Gandhi says, never glorify. What you're doing is horrible. <clears throat> and don't glorify, even when the violence is necessary, don't go, it's tragic. And then the other part with a lot of the Ukrainian responses, which are, again, all understandable, is this vengeance. And they killed our women, our children, our, and we're going to inflict. The only thing they understand is if we kill their innocent people. And that's the only lesson that the Russians understand. And again, that's very uh, anti-Gandhian, that approach. You should... Uh, always be, uh, you know, hesitate to inflict such death and suffering on people who are largely innocent like mm -hmm. that. So I think those are good, good observations. Yep. Well, thank you, Doug. I'm sorry, I, my 
I had a technical glitch there and I was oh. unable to unmute myself <laughs> or come back on the video. But uh -huh. here I am. So uh -huh. okay. thank you all those of us yeah. who stayed the course here today. It's been a great, a great afternoon, Doug. Right. Really great, Doug. Fantastic. Well, I I always enjoy it and the uh discussion part and getting feedback from other people is uh what I enjoy the most. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's and great. That's uh yeah, thanks for organizing and arranging it. And and great to see you and say hello to Elsa. I shall. <laughs> right oh. Great to see you.